Hey everybody, it's Pastor Stephen here with another episode of Ask Anything, where you submit your questions about the Bible, theology, or the Christian life, and then in each of these video episodes, I'm going to attempt to answer one of those questions that's been submitted. Uh, and today's question is a great question that comes from the book of Genesis. And the question is as follows. It says, Genesis 1, 26 and 27 reads this way. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This person who submitted the question refers to this passage and then asks, what is the image of God and what are we supposed to learn from this passage? That's a great question. And one of the first things we should say is that in Genesis 1.26, when it says, then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, the words image and likeness refer to the same thing. Uh, some biblical scholars over the years have suggested that perhaps image refers to one thing and likeness refers to something different. But the majority view is that those two words actually are just two words for the same thing. They refer to this same reality, which is that human beings, apart from all of God's other creatures, were uniquely created in a way that we somehow reflect God's image, that somehow we are mirrors for the character of God himself. Now, of course, the major question that comes up is, what is it about us that makes us created in God's image? What is the imago Dei or the image of God? Now, there have been a few different approaches to that question over the years. And uh, I appreciate how theologian by the name of Millard Erickson characterizes this. He says that basically there are three main approaches to answering that question, what is the image of God? The first view is what we call the substantive view. And the substantive view suggests that there is a characteristic uh, or a quality within the human makeup itself that makes us created in the image of God. What is that characteristic or what is that particular quality that makes us created in the image of God? Well, there's been different answers to that within the substantive view. Some have pointed to human reason as the quality or characteristic that makes us created in the image of God. People have said, well, human beings have the ability to reason and have rationality that is at a higher level than all of God's other creatures. And therefore, perhaps reason is the quality or characteristic that makes us created in God's image. Others have pointed to morality and have suggested that human beings, unlike other creatures, are moral agents. That is, we can make choices and be held responsible for those choices because we have a will. And so we are what would be called moral agents. And perhaps that is the characteristic or quality that makes us created in the image of God. The overall argument is that just as God is an intelligent being and he is a moral being of the highest degree, that human beings also share those qualities or characteristics of being intelligent and being able to be moral agents. So this is the substantive view. It is the idea that human beings have a characteristic or a quality within the human makeup that makes us created in the image of God. And there are different qualities that people might point to to identify what that is. A second view is what we might call the relational view. And the relational view does not so much point to a quality or characteristic within the human makeup, but it refers to the fact that human beings are uniquely created so that we can be in relationship with one another and with God, unlike all of God's other creatures, or at least in a way that God's other creatures are not able to engage in. Another way of putting this is to say that human beings are uniquely created with personality. And when I say personality, what I mean is that we are persons who have the ability to be in relationship with other persons and that this relational aspect of who we are is what it means to be created in the image of God. 
Some people have pointed to the fact that God is a being who is in his essence a being in relationship. God is three persons but one God, and those three persons are in eternity in perfect relationship with one another, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so perhaps just as God is a being in relationship, human beings are created in God's image with personality and the ability to be in relationship with one another and with God, and that is what it means to be created in God's image. That's the relational view. And then a third view is what we might call the functional view. So the functional view argues that the image of God is not so much a characteristic or quality within the human makeup, nor is it our relational capacity, but that the image of God is identified with a specific human function that we can exercise. And that function is usually referred to as our ability to exercise dominion over the earth. So if you go back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, read these words again with me. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then immediately after that, it says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Now notice there, uh, it talks about God creating human beings in his image two different times. And then sandwiched between those is a reference to God saying that we are to have dominion over the earth. And so some have pointed to this text and have said it seems that the image of God is connected with human beings having a specific function, and that is to exercise dominion and rulership over all of God's other creatures. The basic argument is that just as God has dominion over the entire universe, he created human beings to reflect his character and giving them the ability to also exercise dominion over the earth and be the highest of his creatures. So we have three views here. We have the substantive view, we have a relational view, and then we have this functional view. And then the next question we might ask is, well, which view is correct? Which one is the most biblical? Um, I believe that each of these views points to some very true biblical realities. Uh, in the substantive view, I think the substantive view rightly points out that human beings do have reason and are moral agents in ways that we would not uh, say are true of God's other creatures. In terms of the relational view, I think it also points out a truth, which is that human beings can be in relationship with one another and with God in a way that God's other creatures cannot. Um, and then thirdly, when it comes to the functional view, I think that view rightly points out that human beings are given the unique command and ability to exercise dominion over the earth, which is not a role that is given to God's other creatures. And so each one of these views points to a true biblical reality. And so I would argue then perhaps for a fourth position, which is to say that the image of God is not simply one of those three positions that I outlined, but it is some combination of all three together. All three of those views point to unique qualities or characteristics that are true of human beings alone. And so we might say that the totality of those things is what reflects, the, is what comprises the image of God in us. That the image of God is uh, these characteristics. It is our personality and it is our function of exercising dominion over the earth. It's the whole picture. It's the whole package of these various ways that we reflect the character and the person of God. Now, the second part of this question is, what does this mean for us? How do we apply this? How should we understand this today? What implications does it have for our lives? So let me just mention a few things here. First of all, we should note that there is a progression in Scripture when it comes to how the image of God is to be understood. When Adam and Eve were created, they were created in God's image, and before the fall, they were in a state of, of perfection in, in terms of not being in a fallen state. And so they were created in the image of God and were created to reflect that image. And in that state, that image was not um, corrupted at that point. However, 
after the fall, the image of God becomes tarnished. Sin mars and corrupts the image of God within us so that after the fall, the image of God is not lost. It's not as if we are no longer created in the image of God, but the image within us of God has become marred and corrupted and tarnished so that we no longer, after the fall, reflect his image properly and perfectly. Um, because of our sin, it has become corrupted. So then the next biblical question is, how does the image of God become restored within us? And that is what Jesus came to do. He came to restore God's image within us. Jesus reflected the image of God perfectly to us because he himself was and is the son of God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of of his nature. So you might say that Jesus came to show us what it looks like to perfectly reflect the image of God. But he didn't just come to show us what it means to reflect the image of God. He also came to restore the image of God within us. And he did this by dying on the cross for our sins so that our sin could be removed and that through faith we could be given new hearts and so that we could begin to again do what we were created to do, which is reflect God's glory and his character, reflect his image. That's what we were created for. And so you see passages in the New Testament which refer to this reality that when we have new life in Christ, we are to reflect God's image. Colossians chapter 3 verses 9 and 10 says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of after the image of its creator. So after we have new life in Christ, we are being renewed and sanctified so that we can once again, through the power of Jesus Christ, uh, reflect his image and be image bearers, reflecting God's character and his holiness. What are some applications that we can learn from this? Well, there are so many different things I can say here, but let me just mention a couple of things before I conclude. We need to understand that the image of God is universal. That is, every human being, according to scripture, is created in God's image. That means every human being, regardless of age. That means every human being, whether it's a male or a female. That means every human being, regardless of race and nationality and social status. Every human being, without exception, is created in the image of God according to scripture. And this means that every human being, all of humanity has inherent dignity and worth. Let me say that again. Every single human being has inherent dignity and worth. Human life is sacred. And that includes human life from any place on the planet and from any age. I've heard it said that from the womb all the way to the tomb, human life is sacred and is to be treated as such. And it also means that, that human life uh, has inherent dignity. And, and we are called as the people of God to treat others with love and respect, no matter who they are or where they come from, because we are to recognize that they bear God's image. They are created in his image and they are deserving of inherent uh, respect and dignity. Now, we recognize that the image of God has been tarnished by the fall, and therefore none of us in our sinful and fallen state reflect his image perfectly. But we also recognize and are called to, to know and to proclaim that the image of God can be restored through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for those of us who know Christ and who follow Christ, our job is to daily seek to reflect his image into all the world because we are the ones who now have been cleansed by him, have been given new hearts and are to seek through the power of the Holy Spirit to follow in his footsteps and reflect his character and his holiness. That is our calling. That is our mandate. And I want to just close by uh, sharing you with you these words from theologian Millard Erickson because I think they sum it up very well. He says, every human being is God's creature made in God's own image. God endowed each of us with the powers of personality that make it possible for us to worship and serve him. When using those powers to those ends, we are most fully what God intended us to be. 
and then are most completely human. If you want to know what it means to be truly human, you need to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ because it's only when you're in a relationship with Christ and you follow him and serve him that you are being who you were created to be and that you are mirroring and reflecting God himself. Uh, I hope this has been helpful to you and I encourage you to continue sending questions to me for these episodes of Ask Anything. You can send your questions to askanything at highviewepc.org and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.